Econia Scrub Among Florida Lakes by Louise Seymour Houghton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Econia Scrub Among Florida's Lakes by Louise Seymour Houghton. From Lippincott's Magazine of Popular Literature and Science, Volume 26, September 1880. And if you do get lost after that, it's no great matter, said the county clerk, folding up his map, for then all you've got to do is to find William Townsend and inquire. He had been giving us the itinerary for our cross-country journey by way of the lakes to Econia Scrub. How many of all the Florida tourists know where that is? I wonder, or even what it is, the strange amphibious land which goes on from year to year developing, the solid ground into marshy pereiras, the prairies into lakes, bright sparkling sapphires which nature is threading one by one, year by year, upon her emerald chaplet of forest borderland? How many of them all have guessed that close at hand hidden away amid the shadows of the scrub oaks lies her laboratory where any day they may steal in upon her at work and catch a world a-making there are three individuals who know a little more about it now than they did a few weeks since three or shall we not rather say four for who shall say that barney gained less from the excursion than the artist the scribe and the small boy who were his fellow travellers that barney became a party to the expedition in the character so to speak of our lay brother expected to perform the servile labour of the establishment while his superiors were worshipping at nature's shrines in no wise detracted from his improvement of the bright spring holiday it was indeed upon the small boy who beat the mule rather than upon the mule that drew the wagon that the fatigues of the expedition fell he just glimpses around at me with his old eyeball says the small boy exasperate throwing away his broken cudgel and that's all the good it does we knew nothing more of iconia when we set out upon our journey than that it was the old home of an indian tribe in the long ago days before primeval forest had given place to the second growth of scrub and that it was a region unknown to the northern tourist it lies to the southwest of magnolia our point of departure on the st john's river but at first our route lay westerly that it might include the lake country of the ridge it's a pretty country said a friendly cracker of whom despite the county clerk's itinerary we were fain to ask the way within two hours after starting a right pretty country but it's all alike you'll be tired of it afore you're done gone half way is he blind our friend the cracker already in the very outset of our journey we have beheld such very beauties as have steeped our souls in joy after weeks of rainless weather the morning has been showery and on our setting forth at noon we had found the world new washed and decked for our coming birds were singing rainbows glancing in quivering water-laden trees flowers were shimmering in the sunshine the young growth was springing up glorious from the blackness of desolating winter fires such tender tones of pink and gray such fiery-hearted reds and browns and olive greens such misty vagueness in the shadows such brilliance in the sunlight that melted through the openings of the woods all alike indeed no accidents of rock or hill are here but oh the grandeur of those far-sweeping curves of undulating surface the mystery of those endless aisles of solemn whispering pines the glory of color intense and fiery which breathes into every object a throbbing living soul for hours we journeyed through the forest always in the centre of a vast circle of scattered pines upon the outer edge of which the trees grew dense and dark stretching away into infinity our road wandered in and out among the prostrate victims of many a summer tempest 
now we were winding around dark bays of sweet gum and magnolia now skirting circular ponds of delicate young cypress now crossing narrow branches sunk deep in impenetrable hummocks of close-crowded oak and ash and maple thick matted with vines and undergrowth now pausing to gather orchids and pitcher plants and sun kisses and andromeda now fording the broad bend of peter's creek where it flows sapphire in the sunshine out from the moss-draped live oaks between high banks of red and yellow clays and soft gray sand to lose itself in a tangle of flowering shrubs now losing and finding our way among the intricate cross-roads that lead by bradley's creek and darbin savage's tramway and the new blazed road of the county clerk's itinerary suddenly the sky grew dark thunder began to roll and were we in the right road it seemed suspiciously well travelled for now we called to mind that middleburg was nigh at hand and thither we had been warned not to go there was a house in the distance the second we had seen since leaving the settlements near the river and there we learned that we were right and wrong it was the middleburg road after receiving sundry lucid directions respecting a blind road and an old field we turned away how dark it was growing how weirdly soughed the wind among the pine tops how bodingly the thunder growled afar there came a great slow drop another and suddenly with swiftly rushing sound the rain was upon us drenching us all at once before waterproofs and umbrellas could be made available it was then that barney showed the greatness of his soul in the confusion of the moment we had run afoul of a stout young oak which obstinately menaced the integrity of our axle it was only possible to back out of the predicament but barney scorned the thought of retreat not all the blandishments of the small boy whether brought to bear in the form of entreaties remonstrances jerks or threats availed barney stood unmoved and the hatchet was our only resource how that mule's eye twinkled as from time to time he cast a backward glance upon the small boy wrestling with a dull hatchet and a sturdy young scrub oak under the pelting rain amid lightning flash and thunder peal needs a more graphic pen than mine to describe a better drenched biped than climbed into the wagon at the close of this episode or a more thoroughly satisfied quadruped than jogged along before him it would be difficult to find as suddenly as they had come up the clouds rolled away and sunlight flamed out from the west so suddenly that it caught the rain halfway and filled the air with tremulous rainbow hues then burst out afresh the sound of birds sweet scents thrilled up from flower and shrub the very earth was fragrant and fresh resinous odors exhaled from every tree the sun sank down in gold and purple glory and the night swept over the dark woods myriad fireflies flitted round insects chirped in every hollow the whippoorwill called from the distant thicket the nighthawk circled in the open glade a cheerful sound of cowbells broke the noisy stillness the forest opened upon a row of dark buildings and darker orange trees and barking of dogs and kindly voices told us that rest was at hand no words can do justice to the hospitality of floridians whether native or foreign we were now to begin an experience which was to last us through our entire journey here we were a wandering company of who knows what arriving hungry drenched and unexpected long after the supper hour and our mere appearance was the open sesame to all the treasures of house and barn not knowing what our hap might be we had gone provided with blankets and food but both proved to be superfluous wherever we could find a house bad might be the best it afforded but the best was at our service at kay's ferry it was decidedly not bad abundance reigned there 
though in a quaint old fashion and very soon after our arrival we were warming and drying ourselves before a cheerful fire while from the kitchen came most heartening sounds and smells as of fizzling ham and bubbling coffee never was seen a prettier place than this as we beheld it by the morrow's light the house stands on a high bluff worthy the name of a hill which slopes steeply but greenly down to the south prong of black creek better deserving the name of river than many a stream which boasts the designation we crossed it upon a boom pausing midway in sudden astonishment at the lovely view a long reach of exquisitely pure water bordered by the dense overhanging foliage of its high banks stretched away to where a mile below us a sudden bend hid its lower course from view and on the high green bluff which closed the vista were seen the white house and venerable overarching trees of some old estate the morning air was crisp and pure every leaf and twig stood out with clean-cut distinctness to be mirrored with startling clearness in the stream the sky was cloudless no greater contrast could be imagined from the tender sweetness of yesterday the birds exhilarated by the sparkle in the air sang with a rollicking abandonment quite contagious the very kids and goats on the crags above the road caught the infection and frisked about tinkling their bells and joining most unmelodiously in the song while barney crossing the creek upon a flatboat lifted up a tuneful voice in the chorus we turned aside from our route to visit whitesville the beautiful old home of judge b it is a noble great mansion with broad double doors opening from every side of a wide hall and standing in the midst of a wild garden luxuriant with flowers and shrubs and vines and with a magnificent ivy climbing to the top of a tall blasted tree at the gate i came to this place from new haven in twenty nine its owner told us sailed from new york to darien georgia in a sloop and from there in a sailboat to this very spot i prospected all about bought a little pony and rode him well five thousand miles after i began to keep count finally i came back and settled here were you never troubled by indians we asked well they put a fort here in the indian war the government did right here where you see the china trees it was a beautiful green slope beside the house with five great pride of india's in a row and a glimpse of the creek through the thickets at the foot there never was any engagement here though the indians had a camp over there at kay's where you came from but they all went away to the nation after a while did you stay here through the civil war oh yes i never took any part in the troubles but the folks all suspected and watched me they knew i was a union man one day a federal regiment came along and wanted to buy corn and fodder the men drew up on the green and the colonel rode up to the door colonel says i i can't sell you anything but i believe the keys are in the corn barn and stable doors i can't hinder you taking anything by force he understood and took pretty well what he wanted afterward he came and urged me to take a voucher but i wouldn't do that by and by the confederates came around and accused me of selling to the federals but they couldn't prove anything against me there used to be confederate headquarters up there at kay's we asked oh yes and the federals had it too general burney was there for a while one day just after he came a lot of em came over here one of my boys was lying very sick in that front chamber just then the one you know the county clerk well an orderly rode up to the door and called out here you damned old rebel the general wants you i don't answer to that name said i you don't no i don't what ain't you a rebel i don't answer to that name said i well consider yourself my prisoner says he so i walked up there with him judge price was at headquarters just then and he knew me well it seems that the general had heard that i kept a regular rebel commissariat sending stores to them secretly well when the judge had told him who i was the general wrote me a pass at once and then asked is there anything i can do for you 
general said i my son lies very sick i should like to see the last of him and beg to be permitted to retire is that so said the general would you like me to send you a doctor i accepted and he sent me too he came up afterward and found that his men had torn down the fences broken open the store and dragged out goods set the oil and molasses running and done great damage about four thousand dollars worth we estimated you see they thought it was a rebel commissariat when he came into the house he asked my wife if she could give him supper general said she you have taken away my cooks if you will send for your own i shall be very happy to get supper for you he did so and spent the night here sleeping in one of the chambers while his officers lay all over the piazzas next day they all rode away quite satisfied i guess there were several skirmishes about here afterward and we have some pieces of bombs in the house now that fell in the yard the judge pressed us to stay and dine but we had arranged for a gypsy dinner in the woods and were anxious to push on push on how barney could smile could he hear the word he never did anything half so energetic as to push he did not even pull so we bade farewell to our general host and started westwardly again we were now upon the high land of the ridge the backbone of the state and though perhaps hardly ninety feet above the sea the air had all the exhilarating freshness of great altitudes all through the week which followed we felt its tonic inspiration and seemed to drink in intoxicating draughts of health and spirits and never more than during the fifteen-mile drive between black creek and kingsley's pond kingsley's pond the highest body of water in the state is the first of a long succession of lakes which lying between the st john's and the railway have only lately been as it were discovered by the northerner it is perfectly circular in form being precisely two miles across in every direction like all the lakes of florida it is of immense depth and its waters are so transparent that the white sand at the bottom may be seen glistening like stars in common with the other waters of this region it is surrounded by a hard beach of white sand rising gradually up to a beautifully wooded slope being quite free from the marshes which too often render the lakes of florida unapproachable one of the northern colonies which within the last two years have discovered this delightful region has settled on the shores of kingsley's pond although an infant of only twenty months the village has made excellent growth and gives promise of a bright future farming is not largely followed the principal industry of these and the other northern colonists being orange culture a business to which the climate is wonderfully propitious the dry pure air of this district being alike free from excessive summer heats and from the frosts which are occasionally disastrous to groves situated on lower ground in the same latitude though there are few native floridians in this part of the country the neighborhood of the lake rejoices in the possession of a cracker doctress of wondrous powers who but her knows that chapter in the book of daniel the reading of which stays the flowing of blood or that other chapter potent to extinguish forest fires one does not need a long residence in the state to learn to appreciate the good fortune of the lakers in this particular not far from the village on the western shore of the pond lives the one old settler he met us with the hearty welcome which we had learned almost to look for as a right and sitting on his front piazza in the shade of his orange trees gladdening our eyes with a view of his vine embowered pig pen we listened to the legend of the pond yes i've lived here four and twenty year but i done kim to floridy nigh on forty year ago walked here from georgy to join the engine war i done found this place a scoutin about and when i got married i come here to settle the yankee folks wants to change the name of the pond to summit lake in one thing or another but i lays votes square again it every time and allays will you see it don't ought to be changed i don't mind the pond part they might call it lake if 
they think it sounds better but kingsley's it has to be k i n g l e s l e y that i take it is the prompt way to spell the name of the man as named it and that's the name it has to be you see it was this away kingsley were a mail rider leastways express in the old engine war time i don't know how long ago they was a fort on the pond them days over on the south side well kingsley were a comin down toward the fort from the north when he thought he see an engine he looked behind and sure enough there they was a closin in on him he looked ahead again sure's your bone there was a double row of em better n a hundred on all two sides of the trail he hadn't a minute to study and just one thing to do and he done hit he just clapped spurs to his critter and made for the pond he knowed what they wanted of him confidentially and solemnly it were their intention to catch him and scalp him alive you know well they followed him to the pond a whoopin and a yellin all the way makin g sure on him when he got to the pond he rid right in the engines after him but his critter soon began to gin out when he sees that he just gathered up his kit and jumped into the water and swum for dear life two mile that fellow swum and saved his kit and musket the engines got his critter but you never see nothin g so mad as they was to see him get off that away the soldiers at the fort was a-watchin all the time they run down to meet him they see he looked kind of foolish as he swum in and as soon as he struck the show he just flung himself on the sand and laid for half an hour a thought openin g his eyes o speakin g then he done riz right up and toted his kit to the commander and axed to h e p the pond named after him the commander said it mought to be so and so it was and so it has to be i says and alice will it would be impossible to detail the exquisite and varied beauty of the way between kingsley's pond and e c o n i a scrub through the fair primeval forest we wandered following the old alachua trail the very name of which enhanced the charm of the present scene by calling up thrilling fancies of the past for this is the famous indian war-path from the hunting-grounds of the interior to the settlements on the frontier and may well be the oldest and the most adventure fraught thoroughfare in the united states we could hardly persuade ourselves that we were not passing through some magnificent old estate of late perhaps somewhat fallen into neglect so perfect was the lawn-like smoothness of the grassy uplands so rhythmical were the undulations of the slopes so majestic the natural avenues of enormous oaks so admirable the diversity of hill and dell knoll and glade shrubbery and lawn forest and park interspersed with frequent sheets of water blue pond rivaling the sky in color sand-hill pond deep-set among high wooded slopes with picturesque log-mill and house magnolia lake with its flawless mirror crystal of more than crystal clearness with gorgeous sunset memories and sweet recollections of kindly hospitalities in the two homes which crown its twin heights bedford and brooklyn lakes with log cottages beneath clustering trees many lake and its great alligator sleeping on a log starry lily-pad and osceola's punch-bowl deep enough and none too large to hold the potations of a worthy twin lakes scarce divided by the island in their midst double pond low sunk in the green forest slope a perfect circle bisected by a wooded ridge geneva lake dotted with islands and beautiful with shining orange groves always among the lawns and glades the forest slopes and isles of pines with so of wind and song of bird and fragrant wild perfumes always with bright bits of life between the long grand silences a group of men faring on foot across the pine level a rosy bareheaded girl the only girl in the place searching for calves in the dingle who gave us flowers and told us the road with the sweet lingering cadence of the south in her velvet voice two men riding by turns the mule that bore their sacks of corn to mill 
two boys carrying a great cross-cut saw along a sloping lakeside a noble newfoundland dog frisking beside them the fleet bay horse and erect military figure of our host at crystal lake guiding us among the intricacies of the lake colony always with sunny memories of happy hours gypsy dinners beside golden watered branch or sapphire lake the cheery half-hour in the log-house on the hill above the little grist mill with the bright young philadelphians who have here cast in their lot the abundant feast in the farmhouse under the orange trees and the old-time stories of the after-dinner hour the pleasant days at crystal lake where our first day's drenching resulted so happily in a slight illness that detained us in that lovely spot and showed us in the new colony lately settled on this and the adjacent lakes how refinement and cultivation lending elegance to rude toil and harsh privation may realize even utopian dreams the great farm on geneva lake was the first old plantation which we had seen since leaving kingsley's and this lies on the outskirts of iconia scrub which has long been settled by native floridians or georgians it ain't a farmin country above there on the sand hills said our host of the thrifty old farm on lake geneva it's fine for oranges and bananas but the scrub's better for plantin talk about oranges look at that tree afore you a sour tree it were right smart big too but four years ago i sawed it off near the ground and stuck in five buds that tree is done born three craps already fifteen oranges the second year from the bud a hundred and fifty the third and last year we picked eight hundred off her seedlings anybody might have fruit seven year from the seed but they must take care of the trees to do it look at them trees by the fence eight year old them is some of em bore the sixth year every one on em is sot full now full enough for young trees yes that's right smart good orange land up there in the sand hills forty year ago when i came here there was nothing but wild critters in that lake country as the yankee folks calls it all kinds of varmints there was bears tigers panthers cats and all kinds right smart hunting they was and tain't so bad now they's rabbits and coons and possums sure enough and deer too and cats why cats is plenty but they ain't no count i never hunted much myself but i've heerd an old man tell higgins by name if you could find him and could get him right he'd tell you right smart old stories about varmints and engines too i've heerd him tell how he went out with some puppies one time to larn em to hunt bear he heerd one of the puppies a screechin and case he didn't want to lose him he run up the screechin come from a sort of scrub and it got close up afore he see it was a she-bear and two cubs the bear had the puppy but when she see higgins she dropped it and made for him now you know a bear ain't like no varmint nor cow beast it don't go round under the trees but just makes a road for itself over the scrub higgins hadn't no time to a take aim and if he'd a missed he was gone sure enough so he just drawed his knife and when she riz up to clutch him he struck her plumb in the heart killed her dead no i never had no trouble with injuns they was all gone to the nation when i settled here but i saw billy bowlegs once and jumper too i was a-goin through the woods and i met a kirt with three men in it two on em was kinder dark lookin but i never thought much of that till the man that was drivin stopped and axed me if i knowed who he had in behind it was them two chiefs sure enough right good lookin fellers they was too we had left the sand hills of the ridge and had reached the borders of the scrub but there was yet another of the new northern settlements to visit it lay a few miles beyond geneva lake in the flat woods to the south of santa fe lake the largest and best known of the group who does not know the dreary flat woods villages of the south with their decaying log cabins and hopelessly unfinished frame houses with their white roads ankle-deep in sand wandering disconsolately among fallen trees and palmetto scrub and blackened stumps melrose is like them all but with a difference 
the decaying cabins new two years ago are deserted in favor of the great frame houses which unfinished indeed have yet a determined air as if they meant to be finished some day the sandy roads are alive with long trains of heavy log trucks or lighter freight wagons there are men actually buying things in the three stores there is a school with live children playing before the door there are saw and grist mills buzzing noisily there is a post office which connects us with the outer world as we receive our waiting letters there is a stir of enterprise in the air which speaks quite plainly of chicago and the northern states whence have come the colonists there is talk of a railroad to the st john's on the east and of a canal which shall connect the lakes with one another and with the railway on the west there is a really good hotel where we spend the night in unanticipated luxury upon a breezy eminence overlooking the silver sheet of santa fe lake which stretches away for miles to the north and eastward the morrow was almost spent while we lingered in the neighborhood of the lake the road makes a wide circuit to avoid its far-reaching arms and bays only here and there are glimpses of the water seen through the trees and cart tracks leading off to exquisite points of view upon its banks we are in the flat woods again palmetto clumps under the pine trees pitcher plants and orchids in the low spots violets and pingicula beside the ditches vetches and lupins and pawpaw and the trailing mimosa in the sand the park-like character of the woods is gone still there are here and there gentle undulations upon which the long lines of western sunlight slope away the lake gleams silvery through the trees the air is pure and sparkling as in high altitudes it was evening before we could leave the lakeside and plunge into the dense new growth which adds to the ancient name of iconia the modern appellation of scrub amid its close crowding thickets night came upon us speedily how hospitably we were received in the bare new homestead of parson h how generously our hosts relinquished their one barred bed and passed a night of horror exposed to the fury of myriad mosquitoes whose songs of triumph we heard from our own protected pillows how basely barney requited all this kindness by breaking into the corn crib and stuffing himself as full as a sausage as the small boy reported may not here be dwelt upon the early morning was exquisite soft mists veiled all the glorious colors great spider webs strung thick with diamonds stretched from tree to tree a little pothole pond of lilies exhaled sweet odors the lark's ecstatic song thrilled down from upper air there was a gentle hill before us and halfway up a view to the right of a broad lake with the log huts of a settlement on the high bank the sun has drunk up all the mists and shines bright upon the soft gray satin of the girdled pine trees in the clearing flowers are crowding everywhere orange milkweed purple phlox creamy papa azure bluebells spotted foxgloves rose-tinted daisies brown-eyed coriopsias and unknown flowers of palest blue butterflies flit noiselessly among them and mocking-birds sing loud in the leafy screens above a red-headed woodpecker taps upon a resounding tree and screams in exultation as he seizes his prey we skirted viola lake cresting the high hill and descending to a shaded valley where the lapping waters plashed upon the roadside then mounted another hill among thick clustering oaks and giant pines to where three lakes are seen spreading broadly out upon a grassy plain between high wooded slopes and these are aconia twenty years ago a tiny rivulet wandered through broad prairies eight years later a wider stream already beginning to encroach upon the grassy borderland now a chain of ever broadening lakes already drawing near to the hills which frame in the widespread plain famous grazing lands these were once the favored haunts of cattle drovers more famous hunting grounds in older days before firm prairie 
had given place to watery savannah they were indian villages upon the heights above and bloody battles in the plains below but who shall tell the story of those days the indians are gone the cattle drovers have followed them to the far south the new settler of twenty years ago cared nothing for antiquities or for the legends of an older time the dead past is buried even the sonorous old indian name has been softened down to etonia and be it the happy lot of this chronicler to rescue it from oblivion the lakes of the lately traversed lake region, frequent as they had been, were as nothing to those of Iconia scrub. The road rose and fell over a succession of low hills, each ascent gained, discovering a new sheet of water to right, to left, or before us, deep sunk among thick clustering trees. At rare intervals the forest would fall away on either hand opening up a wide view of cultivated fields sweeping grandly down in long stripes of tender green to the billowy verdure of the broad savannah where silvery sparkling lakes lay embedded and great round hummocks of dark trees uprose like islands in the grassy sea in the distance would be barren slopes of rich dark red and silvery gray swelling upward to the far dim mystery of pine woods and the blue arch above we ate our dinner beside lake rosa a circular basin of clearest water rippling and dimpling under the soft breeze toward evening we found the ford which a paralytic old woman sitting in a sunny quarter of a, of a farmhouse piazza had indicated to us as right pretty pretty it was indeed as we came down to it through the most luxuriant of hummocks of transparent foliaged sweet gums and shining leaved magnolias with one great creamy flower right pretty it was too in the old woman's meaning of the word for barney drew us through in safety scarce up to his knees in the transparent water which reflected so perfectly every flower and leaf of the dense water growth the road beyond was cut through an arch of close-meeting trees and farther on it skirted a broad lake which already in its slow sure upward progress had covered the roadway and was reaching even to the fence which bounds the field above in this field is a large mound never investigated although the farmer who owns the property says he has no doubt that it is the site of an indian village for the plough turns up in the fields around not only arrowheads but fragments of pottery and household utensils it was not our good fortune to obtain any of those relics as they have not been preserved and this was the only mound of any extent which we saw such mounds are said however to be not infrequent in the district and indian relics are found everywhere as we drove along the hillside we began to notice frequent basin-like depressions of greater or less size always perfectly circular always with the same saucer-shaped dip always without crack or fissure yet appearing to have been formed by a gradual receding of the substructure reminding one of the depression in the sand of an hour-glass or of the grain in a hopper many of these concaves were dry others had a little water in the bottom all of them had trees growing here and there quite undisturbed whether in the water or not and there was no one who had cared to note how long a time had elapsed since they had begun their decline and fall there is little doubt however that the future traveller will find them developed into lakes as indeed we found one here and there upon the hilltops how many times we got lost among the lakes and potholes the fallen trees and thickets of Iconia scrub it would be tedious to relate how many times we came up down to the prairie level and fearful to trust ourselves upon the treacherous billowy green were forced to try back for a new road along the hillside it would be difficult to say the county clerk's itinerary had ended here and william townsend proved to be less ubiquitous than we had been led to expect thus it was that night came down upon us one evening before we had reached a place of shelter suddenly in the thick scrub not lingeringly as in the long forest glades of the lake country 
For an hour we pushed on, trusting now to Barney's sagacity, now to the pioneering abilities of artist and scribe, who marched in the van. Fireflies flitted about, their unusual brilliancy often cheating us into the fond hope that shelter was at hand. The igneous fatui in the valley below often added to the deception, and after many disappointments we were about to spread our blankets upon the earth and prepare for a night's rest al fresco when we heard a distant cow call. Clear and melodious as the far-off rans de vaches, it broke upon the stillness, gladdening all our hearts. How we answered it, how we hastened over logs and through thickets in the direction of answering voices and glancing lights, no ignis fatri now, how we were met halfway by an entire family whom we had aroused, and with what astonishment we heard ourselves addressed by name, can better be imagined than described. By the happiest of chances we had come upon the home of some people whom we had casually met upon the St. John's River only a few weeks before, and our dearest and oldest friends could not have welcomed us more cordially or have been more gladly met by us. In the early morning we heard again, between sleeping and waking, the musical cow call. It echoed among the hills and over the lakes. There were the tinkling of bells, the pattering of hoofs, the eager, impatient sounds of a herd of cattle, glad of morning freedom. It was like a dream of Switzerland. And, hastening out, we found the dream but vivified by the intense purity of the air surcharged with ozone, the exquisite clearness of the outlines of the hills, the sparkling brightness of the lakes in the valley, the freshness of glory and beauty which overspread all like a world new made. One of the great events of that day was a desperate fight between two chameleons in a low oak scrub on the hilltop. The little creatures attacked each other with such fury, with such rapid changes of color from gray to green and from green to brown, with such unexpected mutations of shape from long and slender to short and squat, with such sudden dartings out and angry flamings of the transparent membrane beneath the throat with such swift springs and fights and glancings to and fro as were wonderful to see it seemed as though both must succumb to the fierce scratchings and clawings and when at last one got the entire head of his adversary in his mouth and proceeded deliberately to chew it up we thought that the last act in the tragedy was at hand the small boy made a stealthy step forward with a view to a capture when presto change two chameleons with heads intact were calmly gazing down upon us with that placid look of their kind which seemed to assure us that fighting was the last act of which they were capable that day too is memorable for the charming scenes it brought us impossible for the pencil to reproduce with all their sweet accessories we have found the ford at last where the blue ribbon of the stream lies across the white sand of our road the prairie stretches out broad and green with many circular islets of tree mounds in the ocean-like expanse the winding road beyond the ford leads between cultivated fields on one side and the tree-bordered prairie on the other up to the low horizon where soft white thunderheads are heaped in the hazy blue the tinkling of cowbells comes sweetly over the sea of grass slow wavelets sob softly in the sedges of the stream fish glance through the water a duck flies up on swiftly whirring wings a great moss-draped live oak leans over the stream and the perfume of the tender grapes which crown it floats toward us on the air again after we have climbed the hill to swan lake and have dined beside half moon pond and have laid our course as the sailors say by our map and the sun straight through the scrub to visit lake ella we come out upon the heights above lake hutchinson the dark greens of the foreground soften into the deep blue shadows in the middle distance lake hutchinson sparkles a vivid sapphire against the distant silvery gray of lake geneva while far away the low blue hills melt range behind range into the pale blue sky our faces were turned homeward but there were yet many miles of the Aconia country 
running to northward on the east of the ridge and lakes and lakes and lakes among the scrub clothed hills a new feature had become apparent in many of them a low reef of marsh entirely encircling the inner waters and separating them from a still outer lagoon reminding us with a difference of coral reefs encircling lakes in mid-ocean the shores of these lakes were not marshy but firm and hard like the lakes of the hilltops with the same smooth forest slope surrounding is a reverse process going on here we wondered from that we have seen in the prairies and are these sheets of water to change slowly into marsh and so to firm land again there are a number of such lakes as these and on the heights above one of the largest which they have called bethel a family of canadian emigrants have recently taken up a homestead there was still another chain of prairie lakes the old field ponds stretching north and south on our right and as we wound around them plashing now and again through the slowly encroaching water we had gator bone pond upon our right the loneliness of the scene was indescribable for hours we had been winding in and out among the still lagoons or climbing and descending the ever steeper darker hills night was drawing on stealthy mists came creeping grayly up from the endless old field ponds fireflies and glow-worms and will-o'-the-wisps danced and glowered amid the intense blackness frogs croaked mosquitoes shrilled owls hooted barney's usual deliberate progress became a snail's pace which hinted plainly at blankets and the oat sack when all at once a bonfire flamed up from a distant height and the sagacious quadruped quickened his pace along the steep hill road a very pandemonium of sounds saluted our ears as we emerged from the forest lowings and roarings and shriekings of fighting cattle wild hoots from hoarse masculine throats the shrill tones of a woman's angry voice the discordant notes of an accordion the shuffle of heavy dancing feet we had but happened upon a band of cow-hunters returning homeward with their spoils and the fightings of their imprisoned cattle were only less frightful than their own wild orgies if we had often before been reminded of italian skies and of the freshness and brightness of swiss mountain air now thoughts of the black forest with all of weird or horrible that we had ever read of that storied country rushed to our minds robber haunted mills murderous inns treacherous hosts terribly strange beds not that we apprehended real danger but to our unfranchised and infant minds the chills and fevers which mayhap lurked in the mist-clothed forest or even a wandering cat seemed less to be dreaded than the wild bacchanals who surrounded us we would fain have returned but it was too late barney was already in the power of unseen hands which had seized upon him in the darkness an old virago had ordered us into the house and when we had declined to partake of the relics of a feast which strewed the table we were ignominiously consigned to a den of a lean-to opening upon the piazza a terribly strange bed indeed was the old four-poster which swayed and shrieked at the slightest touch and myriad the enemies which there lay in wait for our blood we were not murdered however nor did our unseen foes as had once been predicted by a cracker friend quite eat us plumb up bodaciously alive in the early morning we fled though not until we had seen how beautiful a home the old plantation once had been these were not crackers among whom we had passed the night but the native and best not a fair specimen of this class surely but such as here and there in the remoter corners of the south are breeding such troubles as may well become a grave problem to the statesman the legitimate outgrowth of the old regime war orphaned untutored unrestrained contemning legitimate authority spending the intervals of jail life in wild revels and wilder crimes such were the men in whose ruined home we had passed the night there was yet one more morning among the gorgeous foliaged scrub hills 
one more gypsy meal by a lakeside one more genial welcome to a hospitable cracker board and we were at home again in the wide sea of pines which stretches to the st john's in the ten days of our journey we had seen within a tract of land some thirty miles long by forty in breadth more than fifty isolated lakes and three prairie chains had visited four enterprising northern colonies and numerous thrifty southern farms had found an air clear and invigorating as that of switzerland soft and balmy as in the tropics while the gorgeous colorings of tree and flower of water and sky were like a dream of the orient but there said the small boy stopping suddenly with a half unbuckled strap of barney's harness in his hand we forgot one thing after all never found william townsend end of Iconia Scrub by Louise Seymour Houghton